this morning is John 3.16. You know, in the last few years, uh, when I was serving in the parish in Abbotsford there, I retired. They gave me some vicars, about four or five of them in a row. And when they were preaching, I, I had to evaluate them and I told them, don't, don't just stand there and start speaking on all three lessons at once. Pick one of the three lessons. And out of that three lessons, pick one verse at, or a couple of verses and just concentrate on that. It's too much for us just to follow you after. So I'm, I'm going to take my own advice this morning, something which I should do more often. And I'm going to restrict myself to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. And a lot of verses uh, translate this, his only begotten son. This is only son here. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And particularly, I want to concentrate on that word, him. Whoever believes in him. Who is him? <laughs> uh, the him is Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to talk about his person and what he does for us on that cross that we're meditating about here in the season of Lent. And uh, we have a way of, a kind of a shorthand of talking about who Jesus Christ is. Uh, technically or formally they call this Christology, what we believe about Jesus Christ. And. Uh, we have a shorthand for describing it. It's in, I'll have, have you turn that to your hymnals. Uh, 537, hymn number 537. There's kind of a shorthand there for describing who Jesus is. You know this, 537, beautiful Savior. I'm just gonna go over the first verses. So, beautiful Savior, that's who Jesus is, the Savior. King of creation. He was there since the beginning of the world. He's eternal. But here's the phrase that is really the shorthand for describing who Jesus is and what he does for us. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And what should we do regarding this Jesus Christ? Truly I love thee. Truly I serve thee. He's the light of my soul my joy, and my crown. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. <clears throat> Very important that he should be the Son of God. Ah, I used to remind my confirmation class, it's not that Jesus was 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% God and he was a hundred percent man. Necessary that he should be a hundred percent man so that he could die. He prayed, he paid the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death, the Apostle Paul says in Romans. And God, in human form, Jesus Christ, paid that penalty. God died for us in Jesus Christ. And that sacrifice was enough to pay for the sins of all the people of all time who believe in Jesus Christ and call upon him as their Savior. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. While you've got your hymnals handy, turn to the last, the cover, the cover page, because it's got the creeds on it there, the creeds in the Lord's Prayer. You know? Now, one of those vicars, I never realized this until one of the vicars pointed this out to me. It's I, and out to me, I'd rather. Let's look at the Apostles' Creed first. There's just a couple of lines about God the Father. Do you notice that? Maker of heaven and earth. And if you skip to the last first part, it talks about the Holy Spirit and then all of the benefits that Jesus won for us. The Christian church, community of saints, forgiveness of sins and resurrection from the dead and life everlasting. But that whole long middle part, that's about Jesus Christ. 
You see how important it is that we know who he is? And if you go across the page to the Nicene Creed, it's even longer. There's one first paragraph is about God the Father. The last paragraph again is about Holy Spirit and the fruits of Christ's work. But that whole long middle section about Jesus Christ and who he is. And it's even more, more specific about who he is. The, the Apostles' Creed that he was God's only son. But in the Nicene Creed, it goes into greater detail. The only begotten son of God. Before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. It's important, that word begotten, to see. Cats beget cats, dogs beget dogs, horses beget horses, humans begin, beget humans. God begets God, you see, that's the idea here. Not me. One substance with the Father, who for us and for our salvation, that's why he came, for our salvation, he came down from heaven because he existed before he was born and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary was born. You have to name his mother. If he was born, you have to name who his mother was. Uh, this creed that we have, we say it so glibly Sunday after Sunday. You know, people died for that creed. To establish this, that Jesus Christ was eternal, that he was fully God, in a way no other human being was God. At the time that this was established, and it wasn't really uh, solidly proclaimed until the sixth century. There were the Roman emperors, you know, and they claimed they were divine too. And they didn't want Jesus to be greater than they are. So they opposed this movement that said, Jesus Christ is 100% God, who was there eternally, who was there at creation, and then came down from heaven for our salvation. That's what it means when we say that Jesus is the Son of God. And he was also the Son of Man. The Bible talks a lot about the Son of Man. That uh, the Son of Man was a figure who is coming at the end of the world. Uh, it says that in the last paragraphs you know about Jesus. In the creeds, he will come again with glory to judge, that's who the Son of Man is. To judge both the living and the dead. And more than that, that his kingdom will have no end. Jesus Christ is this Son of God, ascended into heaven, the Son of Man who will come again to judge the world, and he also is in heaven in bodily form, pleading and interceding for his church on earth and the church in heaven. He has a ministry there waiting for that great day when he will come to judge the living and the dead and the kingdom of God will be established in his full glory. He gives us, it says in John 3, 16, that all who believe on him should have eternal life. Eternal life means more than just the forgiveness of sins and going to heaven. Eternal life begins in this world. It's a better quality of life. It's a life that we live, the Apostle Paul would say, that we live in Christ Jesus. He says in Galatians, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Having life in Christ involves seeing things as they are from God's perspective. From God's perspective, we are aliens on earth. <laughs> we're aliens because we're sinners. The, we in this world are not what we were meant to be. We were meant to be in fellowship with God. We were meant to be in full loving fellowship with the animals. We were meant to be full loving fellowship with the earth. And the only way we can make it back to God and creation as it was meant to be is through Jesus Christ. This new being in Jesus Christ, his salvation means many things even in this world. 
It means for us living in this world that we have a new and unique set of eternal friends. We call it the Holy Christian Church. We have a unique set of values and principles for living in this world, the principles of Jesus. I want to list the values that uh, I always think of that come from Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are all the values we adopt as Christians. And a generosity of spirit and an optimism about life. Who can defeat us if God is on our side? Third, we have a delirious sense of hope when we live in Christ Jesus because of the resurrection and the inspired belief that through Jesus anything is possible. Do you ever think about this? We have a unique prayer that's unique to us to believe in Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. That's our prayer. And we love the world. We love the world because God loved the world and sent His Son to save it. We, come, we become involved in the world and taking on Christ's mission of saving the world. And we have this continuous battle against sin. You see, we see things from God's perspective and we know we're sinners. We're forgiven sinners, but we still sin and have to continually come back and repent of our sins and ask God and our neighbor again and again for forgiveness. But we shouldn't be discouraged by that. That's making the world better. Christians confess their sins and repent of them, put them behind them, try to do better in the future, and forgive one another, and receive forgiveness of God. That makes for a better world. The great 20th century a theologian, Karl Barth, when he said about this, this battle, continuing battle we have with sin, he said, in order to encourage us, he said this, it's not so much that our sin interferes with our life in Christ. The whole point is our life in Christ is interfering with our sin. We're on the winning side. Christians interfering with their sin is changing the world. It's the hope of the world. Christ living in his people and changing the world is the kingdom of God coming now. We pray for that. His kingdom should come. We're living this out now in the confident expectation of the kingdom, which is to come in heaven and the new heaven and new earth at the, at the end of time. Christ Jesus was lifted up. It talks about that in our gospel lesson, about being lifted up. He means lifted up on the cross. These benefits of Jesus Christ to those who believe in him, this new life in Christ, forgiveness of sins and eternal life is ours all because God in Christ Jesus was lifted up on the cross to give his life as redemption for us for our sins. John 12 reports at the crucifixion that there was a centurion there and it says specifically that he looked up on the cross to Jesus Christ and he made this confession surely this is the Son of God when he saw how he died and how the earth responded to his death with earthquake and darkness looking up to Jesus as God is life and hope as the children of Israel found out, you remember in that story when they were following Moses and snakes came into the camp and bit them, poisonous snakes, and they were dying. And the only way that they could be saved is to look up to this bronze serpent on the cross, and they were healed and had life. That was a foreshadowing of Jesus on the cross. One of my uh, parishioners, her name was Irene, she was a missionary nurse in Africa. In fact, her first training in Africa was with Dr. Schweitzer. <laughs> and uh, her favorite psalm was Psalm 121 because it talked about looking up. And when I visited her many times, she'd repeat that to me. She'd, Remember, 
I look to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. In John 8, and verse 28, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and they asked who he was, he said, when you see me lifted up, the Son of Man lifted up, then you will know that I am He. The church in the season of Lent is all about looking up to the cross of Jesus. And this is what it means to look at Jesus high and lifted up on the cross. It's to realize that we in the whole world are dead in our sins, living in darkness, and are our hope for life, enlightenment, and salvation comes from the cross, Jesus Christ and his cross. The Christian church is the collection of all those who have looked up to Christ Jesus and now live in him. The church of God is eternal. It exists in heaven and on earth. The Christian church in heaven and on earth shares in Christ's mission. Christ is now in heaven bringing before God all the saints who have lived and died in him. He prays for future generations of the church. He presents them to God as righteous because of the blood on his cross. He leads them to worship in heaven. He is present with us now in this worship on earth. Participating in the worship of the Christian church on earth is probably the most radical act we will ever do. It amounts to nothing less than participating in the kingdom of God, standing before the throne of God through Jesus Christ with all the saints of the past. Christian worship amounts to seeing things as they really are and confessing it and acting like it, abandoning the delusions of the world around us. I'm going to summarize with a hymn. I'm going to sing it. I hope you can sing it with me. It's one of the hymns that never made it into our new hymn book, but it was in the old one that I was raised with. It goes like this. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. You know it? So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may come in. You know the chorus. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. That's enough. Let's stand and we'll sing first.